tonight on KQED Newsroom. Special guest Kevin Merida on the future of journalism and his new role as the executive editor of the Los Angeles Times. Plus, more recall elections and efforts to regulate oil and gas drilling with our political experts. And we visit a unique place on the Bay that people call home in this week's edition of Something Beautiful. Coming to you from KQED headquarters in San Francisco this Friday, October 22nd, 2021. Hello and happy rainy Friday. I'm Priya David Clemens and this is KQED Newsroom. We begin with the Friday Five, our picks for some of the top news stories in California this week. Now, despite the wet weather, we are still in a drought. The worst drought since the 1800s, according to Governor Gavin Newsom. This week, Newsom expanded drought emergency actions to cover the entire state. This move allows cities to ban wasteful water usage, such as using drinking water to wash sidewalks or driveways. In Southern California, members of Congress held a subcommittee hearing about that recent oil spill that dumped thousands of gallons of crude oil off the coast of Orange County. Here's Congress member Katie Porter. When a locally owned business like Mr. Brenneman's that has been in the family for four generations loses tens of thousands of dollars because of the leak, that's his subsidy to oil and gas. When a hotel loses its bookings overnight, that's its subsidy for oil and gas. When the fragile decades long effort to recover a species under the Endangered Species Act is finally showing progress, but an oil spill puts it all at risk. That's a cost of oil and gas, too. On Monday, about a thousand parents and students rallied on the steps of the state capitol to protest California's rule that all eligible students must get vaccinated against COVID-19 to attend school in person. Also, according to the state auditor, California schools may need to send $160 million in pandemic response funding back to the federal government if they don't find ways to use that money by the spending deadline. Oakland is expanding its guaranteed income pilot project in which families with very low income can get monthly payments of $500 with no strings attached. The expansion will allow an additional 300 families to apply for this program. They can live anywhere within Oakland city limits. Examples of qualifying incomes are a family of two earning less than $20,000 a year or a family of three earning less than 30,000 annually. Here's Oakland Mayor Libby Schaff. Um, let's be clear, we do not believe that guaranteed income should be a pilot. It should be policy. It should be permanent. And we are proud to be part of a national movement that is creating both the evidence, the data, the research, as well as the stories, the narrative change about who is poor and why they are poor. San Francisco shut down one location of the fast food chain in and out for refusing to enforce vaccination requirements among its customers. The company has called the city's indoor vaccination requirements intrusive, improper, and offensive. However, it has complied and the restaurant is open once again. And that's this week's news recap. I'll be joined later by our political experts, but first, the Los Angeles Times is the largest newsroom in California and its coverage spans the whole state. The Times has had regular turnover in the top leadership position, with nine executive editors in the past 15 years. Our special guest tonight, veteran journalist Kevin Merida, was named the new executive editor in June. Merida began his career as a reporter at the Milwaukee Journal and the Dallas Morning News. He then spent 20 years shaping news coverage as a reporter and manager at the Washington Post, before stepping into his most recent venture with the sports network ESPN. There, Merida launched a hugely successful platform called The Undefeated, which covers sports through the lens of culture and race. Kevin Merida joins us now to share his vision for reshaping news coverage here in California. Kevin, welcome to the show, and I have to say, welcome to California. Thanks, Priya. I'm uh, glad to be with you and certainly glad to be here in California. Well, I understand you moved here, at least in part, to be closer to your family. Well, it's the first time we can bring all of our immediate family together in many years. Our two oldest sons who are in the film business were here, and they've been out here since they graduated from college. But uh, our youngest son came with us, so we have our immediate family together, and uh, that includes a grandson. So it's great to just uh, enjoy this family time. 
Well, so as a newcomer to the state, <clears throat> would you describe how you see California's profile right now in comparison to the rest of the nation? What do you see as our successes and our challenges? Well, look, I mean, ironically, we have a series going on now called uh, the United States of California that talks about California being an, an engine of innovation and a leader in so many different areas. And, you know, certainly we see entertainment, everything that's happening with entertainment, the changing nature of how people are consuming entertainment is here. The, we're the, the, the center of the environmental discussion uh, that is so important globally. Uh, we're at the center of really multiculturalism and, and how we live with each other as uh, the demographics change in neighborhoods and communities and uh, the richness of, of the melting pot, the modern melting pot. And so California's a leader. You know, I look at California really as the, the most important state in the country. You know, with that said, California, it's the fifth largest economy in the world, and yet it doesn't seem like the news here gets the same priority as newspapers on the East Coast. The LA Times is the largest newsroom west of the Potomac, and yet it doesn't have the same sort of uh, gravitas on the national stage. Do you have an ambition to change that? Well, yeah, we're, we're building a place that I, I like to call a modern media company. You know, I think you have to reinvent what a newspaper is uh, today because a newspaper uh, is yet another uh, instrument competing for uh, people's time and, and their money, right? Their subscriptions. And so we want people to feel that the Los Angeles Times is essential and that it's part of their life, their lives. And, and, and so I, I think part of what you're referring to is, is something of an East Coast bias. You know, I think that that does exist. I spent a lot of time on the East Coast. The the major news organizations there, like the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, all anchored on the East Coast. And and so that, you know, in some ways um, uh, is, is why places like the Los Angeles Times and other really tremendous news organizations may not be, they seem so far away. Mm -hmm. But I think uh, California is central and, and we're building something that I think will be uh, really a, a jewel for uh, people. And it's not only for California, you know, with 40 million people, but but we export so much. Uh, and, and I think that there's a lot of interest globally in, in what the Los Angeles Times can provide. Well, when you stepped into the position, you immediately became one of the most influential news executives in the country. And I'm sure it has not escaped your notice that you are one of the few people of color to be in such a position. So how do you see the relationship essentially between your blackness and your work? Well, look, I, I think we're all um, a, a product of, we, we have multiple identities. You know, I was black before I was anything else. You know, uh, I was born black, and, and I think that's very much a part of my identity, growing up black, growing up in black neighborhoods, raised by black parents, and, and they imparted that on me. It's not my only identity. Uh, I think we're all, we all have lots of identities, but we want to bring who you are to your work. And I encourage that in everybody, you know, um, to, to bring their authentic self. That's how we will become greater as the Los Angeles Times, when if we can all bring who we are to the place of work, we shouldn't have to separate that as journalists. And so that's very important to me, and it's a value that uh, I try to spread. Last year, in your own newsroom, Latino journalists sent a letter to the publisher of the LA Times, and it stated that for most of your history, the Los Angeles Times has covered the Latino community in dehumanizing ways, painting us as criminals or victims or simply ignoring us. And at the time, Latino representation at the LA Times newsroom was only 13%. Do you have a goal for the percentage of Latinx journalists that you want to have employed at the Times? Well, look, you know, the, the, the goal is unlimited. You know, there are a, a goal I don't have the, the that they uh, set before I came here, um, we're working on those percentages. But I'll just say this, um, you know, it's it's we have half of our county, half of our city uh, is Latino. And, you know, I think the really important thing is to have representation everywhere, not just 
in the ranks of, of reporters and photographers and video journalists and others, but in management and leadership in the places where the influence can be felt even more. And I'm, I'm actively, uh, you know, concerned about that. We, in terms of coverage, certainly we are working on some efforts to enhance our coverage, uh, be more, you'll, you'll see later about new, new products and new initiatives, which not prepared to talk about yet. Uh, they're in development. And so I think that um, we're, we very much are going to really be aggressive about increasing uh, Latino journalists, but also just about our coverage, you know, and how we get closer to our communities that matter. Would you tell me about a time when you had a tough story to cover? What was it? How did you manage it? When we were doing a project, Being a Black Man, it was a series at the Washington Post. And it was a very important series. It was groundbreaking at the time. Uh, it was a, a series that involved narrative stories of black men in all different walks of life. And we took on big topics and hard topics. And we, we had decided that we didn't want black men to be kind of bit players in their own narratives and a, a collection of statistics. They have been studied, like I, I joke, they've been studied more than than sharks, you know. Mm. Uh, there have been all kinds of studies about the plight and condition of black men. And so to get that series right and, and, uh, and do polling and, and tell stories, we had to tackle everything. Uh, I personally decided to take on the story of the black men that sometimes are scary for others who don't know them, those who are on the, the nightly news uh, with mugshots and those who who have robbed and, and, and killed and were stick-up artists and, and spent time in prison. At the time we did the series, two million black men had been to prison. But it was important that that everyone be seen, you know, and be understood. And, and so that, uh, I had done a profile of a particular black man who had been in and out of prison and served time and by his own admission, responsible for, for guns and had been accused of, of, of murders, but had beaten the rap. And to really try to understand that lifestyle and that, and what he was trying to do, which he was really trying to turn his life around. But, but at some point, the larger society will not let you do that. You know, um, and you get, if you go into the criminal justice system uh, as a black man, it's very difficult to, to escape that, you know, early on, even when you're young. And so, to try to understand the that life was a really complex uh, job. It was one of the hardest things I'd ever done. And I hope, you know, I was successful at it, but it was um, a really important story. Last year, I'd say the spread of the coronavirus was absolutely the top story. This year, it's all about the COVID-19 vaccine. So what is your prediction for the biggest story of 2022? <laughs> wow. Uh... You know, who knows? It, it's probably going to be something that doesn't happen. I do think that there are some topics that are are undercover, you know, and and certainly mental health is one. You know, I, I think it's really, you know, slowly built as a as a topic in a lot of ways, particularly as athletes and others have given it visibility. But I think in everyday life as a product of in some ways uh, a product of COVID and everything that we've gone through as a as a product of of the reckoning in America and the protests in the wake of of George Floyd but but part of everyday life the stresses and pressures on on people and mm -hmm. and I, I think that mental health is probably one of the most undercover topics in the country last question in two years what do you expect that we will see that's different about the Los Angeles Times under your leadership well I think that we will do different things. We'll we'll have a wider, more open newsroom, a more collaborative newsroom. We will do creative, uh, experimental things. Uh, you might you might see us produce a soundtrack of Los Angeles. You know, you might see us you know initiate a community journalism project. You might see us with a mural uh, series with a collection of artists. You will probably see us with books and you know maybe not all this had happened in two years but these are the the kinds of things uh la times books la times docuseries you'll a, a real multimedia company and i think you'll begin to see how 
our journalism will expand and 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 grow and be ambitious. Well, Kevin, we're excited to hear it and looking forward to watching it all unfold uh, over the years to come. Thanks for coming on the show, Kevin Merida, the new executive editor of the Los Angeles Times. Thanks, Priya. Turning now to politics. The San Francisco Department of Elections has set a February 15th date for the recall of three San Francisco school board members. The recall follows months of controversy over efforts to rename 44 schools in the midst of the pandemic, racist tweets from board leadership, and tensions over reopening schools. Also, Governor Newsom has announced a proposal to ban new oil and gas wells from operating close to schools, homes, and healthcare facilities. Joining us now to discuss this and other political news are San Francisco Chronicle senior political writer Joe Garofoli. Hi, Joe. Hi. Nice to have you here with me in studio. Good to be back. And joining us by Skype is KQED politics and government reporter Katie Orr. Hi, Katie. Hi, Priya. So, Joe, let's start with the school board recall. Yes. Refresh our memories on the myriad reasons why people are unhappy enough to vote to have this recall of three of its board members. And there are myriad. Let's start with some of the ones you mentioned. Uh, the last year, you know, a lot of parents were ticked off that the San Francisco schools were closed while private schools were open uh, and, and public schools in other districts were open. They were ticked off about the, all the time that the board spent in the renaming uh, those 44 schools. Some of those schools, by the way, were Dianne Feinstein Elementary and, and Lincoln High School. Uh, there was also concerns about uh, removing uh, merit-based application or admissions to uh, Lowell High School, one of the very top high school, very era. competitive high school in the city. And then, of course, there's the whole uh, saga around and Allison Collins, one of the board members, she had the anti-Asian tweets. They removed her from the vice president position. She sued the district for $87 million. She eventually dropped it. And then we have uh, the city attorney suing the school district uh, to keep it open, to open the yeah. classes. Uh, on top of all that, the district has a $116 million shortfall and this recall election is gonna cost $8 million. It's gonna come out of uh, San Francisco taxpayers' wallets in some form or another. A lot to clean up there. A All lot. right. Katie, some students and parents are also unhappy about mandatory vaccinations for students, and they protested up in Sacramento this week. Can you tell us more about that situation? Sure, uh, vaccine protests are not anything new in Sacramento, especially over the past few years. But this one I feel like took on um, a particular intensity among, we should say, the very small but vocal minority of people who are opposing these mandates. Basically, Governor Gavin Newsom has said that all students, whether in private or public schools, eventually will have to get a COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, and if you don't like that, you're gonna have to pull your kid out and homeschool them. Uh, so these parents are furious about that. They staged uh, walkouts around the state on Monday where they pulled kids out of their class. They had various protests. However, uh, despite the numbers that they might bring out to the Capitol, I really don't see this changing. Uh, mm -hmm. California has mandated other kinds of vaccines for school children. And especially once the FDA mm -hmm. gives these vaccines final approval, I feel like it's it's a, basically a done deal in California. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that goes into effect next school year, is that right? Yes, that's right. And they expect that uh, grades seven through 12 will receive their final uh, FDA approval for shots beginning in July. Okay. Uh, Joe, let's turn to Governor Newsom and this new proposal he made this week to ban new oil and gas development close to schools and on some other public facilities with can't be within 3,200 feet. So are you expecting to see more proposals like this over this coming year? Yeah, what are well, the obstacles? You know, the obstacles are, are the oil industry. Mm -hmm. uh, they, in 2020, they spent $10 million in lobbying in Sacramento. So they're a very powerful force. In addition, they're often joined by the building trades union, one of the most powerful unions in the state. And uh, so it's, it's sort of a, a labor and industry a, a combination there that is tough to overcome. They've, they've shot down legislation in the past. And you know, as for this, as some of the uh, environmental activists are upset that it only pertains to new drilling sites mm -hmm. down the road. It doesn't uh, affect existing ones. And I was surprised, I 
two million Californians live within those buffer zones. I was surprised. Mm -hmm. Much of it is in you know, Kern County and Southern uh, California, oil country in California. But it's, uh, this is, but I, I don't know about oil. You'd think given the green uh, 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 power we have in California, yeah. that more of this stuff would be passed, but it's, there's a, industry forces are very strong. There's still a fight there. I want to stick with you for a moment because uh, Governor Newsom did veto some bills this year and some were yeah. sort of surprising. One against farm workers voting mm -hmm. by mail. Another one uh, that you mentioned in your column this week that advocates say would help homeless people get mental care. Right. And in your column, you mentioned that the governor's veto has a lot of power here in California, and it has for a few decades. Yeah, I, and there has, but there, uh, the uh, it's not been overridden since 1980. That's incredible. 19, Jerry Brown, Jerry Brown was governor, and he had hair at that point. I mean, <laughs> I, I did too. Uh, so he, but uh, and a lot of these. So Newsom uh, signed 92 percent of the bills that came mm. before him. But uh, so I went looking at some of those ones that he didn't, and a lot of them have universal support, even Republicans right. and Democrats. But the reason that they don't push back on them, and I've talked to a number of legislators about this, is because they said, you know, it's one thing to vote no on something on paper when mm -hmm. you know it's gonna pass, but if you're gonna say, okay, let's get two thirds of each house to go up against the governor on this, and endanger your own uh, priorities, mm -hmm. then a lot of legislators are not mm -hmm. so enthused about they that. And, and they'll back off a little yeah. about that. And, and remember, let's, we always have to quote, quote The Wire. Remember Omar Little in The Wire? He said, you come at the king, you best not miss. Right. Uh, and so he, uh, th there's a reluctance to go at, uh, uh, to challenge the governor mm -hmm. and try and override his veto. There's been no talk mm -hmm. of overrides on any of these on any of the legislation that passed this okay. time. Okay, um, Katie, let's turn to some news that's happening today out of um, the East Coast, where the Supreme Court has said it is refusing to halt the law in Texas related to abortion. While it's under consideration, this law will not be halted. So, what does this mean for Californians? Well, of course, in California, our laws regarding abortion are very different from those in Texas. California sees itself as a safe haven for reproductive rights. So what providers here and supporters uh, of abortion here, abortion rights here are expecting, are really to see a surge of patients come to California, especially as more states begin to enact more restrictive abortion laws. Uh, there's a feeling that we'll see um, people in need of abortion abortion services flock to your more liberal states, in New York, um, here obviously California. We might see a lot of people get flights to Los Angeles and you know San Francisco, places they can come directly. And so what the state is preparing for uh, are is to make sure that the there are structures in place to help those people, you know, helping them find places to stay, helping them buy a plane ticket, helping mm -hmm. them perhaps paying for the procedure. That is really where California is focused right at the moment. And the San Francisco Chronicle has also done some work on this. Joe, I want to bring you in here because you actually went to Oklahoma City to talk with people there about how this Texas ruling is impacting neighboring states. Right, my, my colleague Gabrielle Lurie and I went to Oklahoma City and we talked to women uh, who had driven hundreds of miles from Texas. Uh, uh, this is both before and after this, this, uh, this law went into effect. And uh, you know, th these women have, uh, they can't get um, uh, appointments in Texas mm -hmm. because of that, you know, that six week window is so tight. And then they, they get up at five in the morning, they drive several hundred miles to have the procedure in Oklahoma City, they have to drive through protesters, and then they have to turn around and come back. This is not, I talked to one woman who's a, who's a bartender, she got off her shift at four in the morning, she got, and her friend drove her up for hours and hours. This is, the, this is and not everybody can do this. Mm -hmm. This is only with women of means can do this, or, or some kind of means to do this. And, and other women are, are doing all sorts of things. They're drinking a lot of vitamin C to try and, you know, and, and induce, mm. a, to, to, to induce a, an abortion themselves. It's, it's, a, it's a terrible mess. Mm. Joe, let's talk more about a story I brought up at the beginning of the show, universal basic income that's starting in Oakland. First, let's listen to a soundbite from Mayor Michael Tubbs, who started the program in Stockton. Mm -hmm. People don't get lazy. People actually become more productive and are able to pay for childcare, are able to pay for the, the car fix, are able to do the things necessary to get to work. People are able to leave part-time jobs and move to full-time jobs. There certainly seems to be strong political will to continue this program in Oakland, potentially elsewhere in California. 
Yeah, the state has $35 million to play with this year to, to seed pilot programs around the state. Oakland's program is expanding. 600 families will get 500 bucks a month. And we think 500 bucks, what's that for, for people who have jobs? But for many people, for half of America, they can't afford an unexpected expense of $400 or more. This is money is being used in the right way. And Katie, you want to get in on this as well. You've got a little something to add. Well, I just wanted to point out that we've actually had kind of a trial uh, universal basic income in, in the country during the pandemic. Millions of people received stimulus checks from the government because they had lost work or seen their hours reduced uh, due to this pandemic. I think going forward, though, um, leaders are going to have to look at how long these programs last and, um, you know, the stigma as associated with getting government uh, assistance as well. All right, Katie Orr with KQED. Thank you for your time today, Katie. Thank you. And Joe Garofoli with the San Francisco Chronicle. Joe, thanks for coming into the studio. Good to be back. Thank you. This week's look at something beautiful is Sausalito's colorfully painted houseboats, which artists like Otis Redding and Shel Silverstein flocked to in the 1960s. Today, there are over 400 houseboats brightly bobbing in this Richardson Bay community. And that's the end of our show for tonight. Thank you for joining us. If you want to get a look behind the scenes, then please hang out with us online too. KQED Newsroom is on Twitter and Facebook, or email us at knr at kqed.org. And you can reach me on Twitter at Priya D. Clemens. We'll see you right back here next Friday night. Have a great weekend.